Welcome to Sword of the Spirit, written and presented by Colin Dye, Senior Minister of Kensington Temple and leader of London City Church. Sword of the Spirit is a dynamic teaching series equipping the believers of today to build the disciples of tomorrow. We pray that you find these programs inspiring and a catalyst in deepening your knowledge of God, your relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, and your intimacy with the Holy Spirit. Hello and welcome to the Sword of the Spirit, a school of ministry in the Word and the Spirit. Our topic is the Kingdom of God, or as I have preferred to call it, the Rule of God, because this focuses on the personal rule of God in our lives and our response is to surrender to the rule of God. And Jesus, in his teaching on the Sermon on the Mount, tells us what it means to live our lives under the rule of God. He talks about the, the character of the heart as we're born again by the Holy Spirit, given a new life, a new heart, and he spends time teaching on those attitudes, those inner attitudes. But then Jesus also goes on to talk about how those attitudes are fulfilled in everyday situations. And at this particular point in the sermon, Jesus is going to raise two things. He's going to raise anger, and he's going to raise sexual immorality and the lust of the heart. And it's so interesting how he does it because he says this isn't about keeping a kind of law that says, thou shalt not murder. Of course, there's no way that we could, we could accept that taking the life of somebody else is, is to be found within the kingdom of God. But Jesus says it's deeper than that. He says, if you actually are angry with somebody in your heart, then before God, it's the same as having murdered them. And this tells us how Jesus handles the law of Moses. The law of Moses says, thou shalt not kill. And we recognize that. But Jesus takes it deeper. He applies it to the heart and he says, it's not just about doing something or not doing something externally. It's about an attitude of your heart. And so he calls us to deal with the sin of anger, which is at the root of this sin of murder. And so Jesus radicalizes the law of Moses and says, I want you to get to the very bottom of this. It's about how you live your heart and how you live your life before God. So don't be angry. How do we deal with this? What are the implications? What are the responsibilities we carry? Jesus is answering all these questions at this particular point in the sermon. And I pray that as you hear this teaching today, that God will root out any anger that you have in your heart and God will bless you instead with his love. God bless you as you watch today. Now, according to the law, there was wrongdoing and punishment for murder. You shall not murder. Whoever murders will be in danger of judgment. And you see in the manual the Old Testament references that spoke of what that judgment was. But now Jesus says, that's what you've heard, but now listen to what I'm saying. Whoever is angry with his brother shall be in danger of judgment. Whoever says fool shall be in danger of the council. Whoever says traitor shall be in danger of hell fire. In other words, Jesus is saying, it's not just the outward act of murder that God is against. And he is against, that's foolish to say he isn't. He's also against the anger that's in your heart that leads to murder. And he, fa he says, in fact, if you are angry in your heart against a brother, God sees that as murder. Don't look at me, just put your guns away. So many people come into church meetings and live their lives as Christians armed to the teeth. They take out their gun of accusation, bang. They take out their knife of in unforgiveness and stab. They commit character assassination. They murder one another by anger and by not dealing with that anger. And then Jesus goes on to show further more that what this means to deal with anger, he says that practical reconciliation is of paramount importance. Here in his teaching, he even places it higher than worship. Reconciliation is more important than worship. How many people come to worship God and yet harbor anger in their hearts? 
God doesn't even hear their worship. And then he goes on to say, if you have come to bring your gift to the altar, in other words, you've come to worship, you've come to sacrifice. He's speaking, of course, in first century language to these Jewish people. We don't worship God that way, but our sacrifice is a sacrifice of praise. Our sacrifice is worship and thanksgiving. When we come to worship God and bring, give God thanks, we must be willing to be reconciled and willing to take the initiative in reconciliation. So here's where all the beautiful attitudes that we were talking about earlier must be manifested. To be poor in spirit, to mourn, to be meek. All of these things need to come to be expressed in our relationships. And uh, a, a marvelous way in which the New Testament takes this teaching up is found in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 26. Let's read it. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let sun go down on your wrath, nor give place to the devil. Let, uh, and then... Also goes on later on um, in um, verse 31. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice and be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, just as God in Christ forgave you. So this is how we're to live. Now notice how Jesus takes the law and develops it. I'll outline this in detail now, but it applies to all of the principles that are to come. He takes the law and develops it in four ways. Now notice this. First of all, he radicalizes the law. He makes it more radical because the righteousness that God has for us in the kingdom is more radical than anything that we see under the law of Moses or even in the scribes and Pharisees. Their righteousness was legalistic. This righteousness is radical. Instead of abstaining from murder, which for most of the population is a relatively easy thing to do. Instead of merely abstaining from murder, Jesus says you abstain from anger. And if there's anger in your heart, you deal with it very quickly. He makes it internal. It's not just the outward acts, but also the inner attitudes. He also increases the punishment because he says the judgment of the law would just cost you something in the physical realm. But the judgment in the kingdom will cost you something in the spiritual realm. The issues are very, very, very real. He says if you hold anger in your heart against your brother, you will be in danger of hell fire. I believe this is a reference to 1 Corinthians, well, not a reference to 1 Corinthians 3.15. 1 Corinthians 3.15 is a reference to this. Paul says, if anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved as though through fire. And so you're, you will be tested by the fire. It's my interpretation here that the fire that we pass through is the same fire that the non-Christians will suffer eternally. But when we pass through that fire, the blood of Jesus Christ preserves us and we are not consumed, glory to God. But our works are burnt up. Our evil deeds are burnt up. This is not purgatory. Purgatory is where your sins are purged. That's the false teaching of a certain section of the Christian church. But there's only one thing that purges you from your sins. It's not the fire of hell or any fire. It's the blood of Jesus Christ. But having been forgiven, and, yet, and you have these things that you've been doing, you can't just enter into heaven like that, my friend. You're carrying works. And he wants to judge those works so that he can reward you accordingly. And so the evil things will be burnt up, the things that you've not done with the right motive, those things which are not being uh, covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. You've not sought God to forgive you, and you've not put them right. Those things will be burnt up, and you will suffer loss. But the things that you've done to honor him, and to praise him, and to glorify him, they will stand the test of fire, and they will come in with you into the kingdom of heaven, and that will determine your place in the kingdom of heaven. Remember Jesus said, if whoever teaches these commandments that you should break them, they'll be called least. 
What we're talking about here is not your eternal destiny. That's fixed and sealed forever by the blood of Jesus Christ. Not even the devil himself can, can contradict that. Amen? Nothing shall separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus. The blood of Jesus seals you for eternity, washes you and cleanses you, and qualifies you for entrance into heaven. But we're not now talking about your eternal destiny. We're talking about your eternal rewards. And my view is it's the same fire that tests them. The same fire that the non-Christians will have to get into and be there forever, and they themselves will perish. But we will pass through that fire. We will not perish. But those works that we've done, which displease him, will perish because at the judgment seat of Christ, he will be testing our works, judging what is done, what we did on this earth, so that he may bless us and reward us. And on the basis of that reward, we will enter the position in heaven that has been appointed for us. Notice how Jesus changes focus. He changes the focus away from rules to himself and himself alone. This is how I cannot understand anybody who would read the Sermon on the Mount and say, well, here's the nice teaching of a good religious leader. Here's moral teaching that we can accept. Or people to say, I'll accept the moral teaching of the Sermon on the Mount, but I won't accept Jesus as Savior. Jesus isn't saying, look, here's some good suggestions. He points to no authority outside of himself. He speaks as a greater than Moses, and he sets aside the Old Testament and the Old Covenant to establish a new relationship with God. How can you, when you see these standards, do anything else other than say, oh my God, I can't live like this. I need you, Jesus, to be my Savior, that I might be born again, that I might be anointed with your Spirit to live a life like this in submission to your authority. But remember, in setting aside the Old Testament, Jesus is not abrogating the law. He's not destroying the law. The law is good. It was God's plan and God's purpose. Instead, he builds on it and establishes it in the kingdom through his personal rule. Also notice this. In Jesus' teaching on anger and reconciliation, he says, if you are there at the altar, and you know that someone has something against you, in which case they think you have sinned against them. Go to your brother and be reconciled. And do it then. And then come back and offer your gift. So in other words, this is more important than worship. And in Matthew 18, Jesus says something similar, but it's in the other, other position. He says, if you have something against your brother, if you believe that your brother has sinned against you, go and show him his fault, just between the two of you. Go and do it. And then if he won't listen, take two or three, that everything may be established by witnesses. And if he won't listen to them, take it to the church. And if they won't listen to the church, then the church, not because of what they did to you, but because they won't listen to the church, which is the body of Christ, then they're refusing to listen to Christ. And then they are to be judged as an unbeliever, and we're to treat them as an unbeliever. We don't know what the state of their heart is, but we are to not regard them as believers. So it's very important. That's how far God wants to take this reconciliation process. But notice this, that whether you think somebody has sinned against you, or whether they think you've sinned against them, your responsibility is to go to them. And the ideal is this, I'm here praying, and I realize that somebody thinks that I have sinned against them, so I go to meet them and try and resolve it. And at the same time, somebody realizes in their mind that they're holding something against me, and so they come to meet me because they're obeying Matthew 18, I'm obeying Matthew 5, and we meet each other in the middle. That's what meeting each other halfway is all about. Did you know that? Meeting each other halfway is not about compromise. Meeting each other halfway is about both of us are going all of the way to reconcile this and to see peace restored to the body of Christ. Dr. J. Adams, 
the Christian counselor and theologian, says that few things are sapping the strength of the church of Jesus Christ more than the unreconciled state of so many of its members. It's so important. If we're living under the rule of God, you live, need to live right with each other as well as right with God. Now, the second of these teaching segments deals with sexual purity. And in Matthew chapter 5, verses 27 to 30, Jesus said, You have heard it said, you can see that, another section beginning, You have heard it that it was said to those of old, You shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that whoever looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out and cast it from you. For it is more profitable for you that one of your members perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and cast it from you. For it is more profitable for you that one of your members perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. Now here, Jesus deals with another one of those commandments of the Old Testament, one of the Ten Commandments about adultery. You shall not commit adultery. But again, he sets out, sets the, the rules of the kingdom against the, the uh, sorry, he sets the rules of Moses against the rule of the kingdom. You have heard it said, but I say to you. He, first of all, he talks about the legal prohibition, you shall not commit adultery. Then he lays down the kingdom standard. And again, it's far more radical than the Old Testament law. He said adultery is not just the outward act, it's the in, inward lust. And if you look at a woman lustfully, or a woman looks at a man lustfully, it works both ways, then you are committing adultery if the person is married. Adultery is, is extramarital sex. Fornication is premarital sex, but it, it's talking about sexual sin here, not just adultery. So Jesus goes further and, and says, it's, it, it's something that's in your heart. And then he says, now if that's real, and if you really want to live under the rule of God, then you must take practical steps to avoid sexual sin, even in your heart. Take practical steps to avoid lust. And he, he goes further, because the picture he uses here is only an illustration. It is only a picture. He doesn't mean it literally, of course. So that goes to show you can't treat this as law. Because if you treat this as law, any, in a lawyer's hands, this would mean you'd lose yours. Do you understand what I'm saying? He's not talking legalistically about plucking out your eye and cutting off your hand. He's talking about taking radical steps to avoid all forms of sexual impurity. Hmm. Very, very important. In today's environment, in the world which is full, of, particularly the Western world, full of sexual promiscuity. I saw a discussion on a television program and there was a Jewish rabbi talking about standards of morality and how you should save yourself for your marriage and how you should have one partner and you should not have sex before marriage and some editor of some newspaper actually believed that you should. She was making it a rule that you should. He was making it a rule that you shouldn't. Now, I, I'm not criticizing the Jewish man as if he was being legalistic because that is what it means to live under the rule of God. Jesus himself said, if you're living under my rule, you will not engage in sexual relations before marriage. And some say, well, I've heard of couples who, who go all the way but full sexual intercourse and say, well, we haven't had sex. We haven't dis sinned and disobeyed God. <laughs> what about lust, my friend? You don't even have to lift a finger. You don't have to do anything physical at all and still commit sin in this area because it's to do with the attitude in your heart. It's to do with what's going on in your heart. Again, as I say, he makes it more radical. He makes it internal. It's to do with what's going on inside you. He increases the punishment again. He says, this is, there are eternal consequences here. Eternal consequences in your behavior. And again, he changes the focus. 
He brings it again upon himself, upon his authority. And isn't it better to live under the authority of Jesus Christ than try to live under rules and regulations that don't quite fit and don't quite cover your situation? That's what it means to be led by the Holy Spirit. It's out of relationship for him, to him. It's not just some authoritarian figure telling you what to do, what not to do. That would be little better than living under the law. But this is your loving Savior with whom you have a relationship who has your best interests at heart, who loved you, who died for you, who in fact is living within you, so to speak, by his Holy Spirit, who will empower you and who will reward you. You're doing all this for him. Your whole motivation is different. Now once again, Jesus is not negating the law. Remember that. Can you see how he's filling it out? He's actually even getting behind the law, to its real purpose. But look at the practicality of this. It's so practical. Jesus says, if your hand offends you, cut it off. If your eye offends you, pluck it out. In other words, you take whatever radical step necessary to stop you from sinning sexually. In your mind, in your heart, let alone everything, of course, outwardly, physically. Let me give you an example. If you cannot control that television knob and you are watching things which are dishonoring to God, not just in this area of sexual purity, but in anything, and you can't control that knob, chuck the television out. B, take a gun and shoot it. <laughs> if it's rented, better send it back. Do you understand? If your eye offends, you pluck it out. And it'll be, if you get rid of your television, it would be impossible ever to be tempted that way again. Doesn't mean to say the lust will go. Because the sin's still in your heart. You've got to deal with the other things as well and, and deal with your heart. But it means that you take every step that you possibly can physically to avoid sexual sin. And you must do that in every area of your life. So there may be people here today listening to me or watching me today and you need to go home and do something. You need to seek God and chuck out those magazines. Chuck away those novels or anything else that is in, that is polluting you. And why, if you're wanting to resist temptation, why do you put yourself in the way of temptation? How can you pray, Lord, deliver me from temptation when you put yourself there in the first instance? Sometimes it's far too late to say, Lord, help me. And I don't wish to be crude. But when you're in a compromising situation, in the back seat of a car with some man or some woman, to say, Jesus, help me. Too late, my friends. Deal with it radically. Deal with it early. Amen? Amen? That's what it means to live under the rule of God. And that's something not even Moses could talk about. In fact, Moses would be saying, Hallelujah, I wish I could have said all that, but I, I wasn't Jesus. Now why, when Jesus says, I say to you, is it such good news? What's the difference between Jesus saying it and Moses saying it? Oh, apart from who Jesus is, it's much more, much more marvelous than that. It's not just because he has high authority, because when Jesus says, I say to you, he is talking about what he will personally enable you to do by the Spirit. He can give you a higher standard and call for a higher standard because he's going to lead you and empower you. And it's his yoke that's on you. It's his righteousness that's going to be expressed through you. It's his holiness that's going to be imparted to you. It's his Holy Spirit that's going to empower you to do it. Moses couldn't do that. Moses could tell you in some kind of way what was right and what was wrong and make rules and regulations that would point to the coming of Christ who would give you power to live like that. Now, the third area is marriage. And again, Jesus contrasts the permission for divorce in the law with his approach to marriage. It says, furthermore, it's been said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you, whoever divorces his wife for any reason except sexual immorality causes her to commit adultery. Whoever marries a woman who is divorced is, uh, also commits adultery. Here again, Jesus says, you've heard it said, but I say to you. He states the legal position and then modifies it. 
And in fact, in this instance, he withdraws the permission of divorce that was given in the Old Testament in Deuteronomy chapter 24. He withdraws that permission. Moses allowed it because of the hardness of their heart. But we're kingdom people. Our hearts aren't hard. We have the power of the Holy Spirit. And so Jesus withdraws what Moses allowed because he's bringing in a higher standard. And he stresses, rather, the permanence of marriage, and he allows divorce and remarriage for only one reason. Here, and that's for sexual sin. That's the only grounds. But in Deuteronomy 24, it was much more liberal than that. Not that Jesus is liberal, but the standard was very, very low in the Old Testament. It doesn't even specify. It says, if your wife displeases you, then write a certificate of divorce. Actually, it was a way of regulating divorce. It was merciful, a way of regulating divorce, but it was nothing like Jesus' teaching. He changes the legal requirement, and here he lifts it up to a higher level. So read about it in Deuteronomy 24. Read about it also in Matthew 19, verses 1 to 10. And then, as we continue through this process, we see Jesus is constantly bringing us back to what it means to live under his rule, to live under his reign. It's not living according to Moses' law, legalistic standards of righteousness. It's living higher than that. It doesn't mean to say we can say, well, I'm in the kingdom, I can do as I like. You will keep the law of Moses in all of its essential principles. You will keep the law of Moses far better than any of those people kept the law of Moses because living under the rule of God means that you are lifted up to a higher standard of righteousness. But it's not righteousness in and of yourself. It's righteousness in and through the power of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, next time we're going to come back and pick it up from there and look at more ways in which Jesus illustrates the righteousness of the kingdom. God bless you as you live under the rule of God.